After doing thousands of tax returns like myself, you start to see smart people have the same confusion and misunderstandings about personal finances from smart people. Some of these misunderstandings are kind of benign. Some can really damage your finances. So I wanted to put together a list before tax season rolls around about the all too common topics and questions I get from my tax clients year over year. So much financial advice online focuses on max out your Roth IRA every year, but not everyone is allowed to contribute directly to an IRA. You may do so only if you make less than a certain dollar amount. So in 2023, that's 153,000 to file single, 228,000 to file jointly. So yes, there's plenty of people that make under that income threshold. Either you're early in your career, you took partial year on paid leave, you're in a role that simply isn't compensated that highly, but there's plenty of people who make more. So we see this confusion arise frequently when people start with a low income and are therefore allowed to contribute directly, and then their income increases. So in general, that's awesome, more money. But people don't realize that they're no longer eligible to contribute directly to the Roth IRA, and so they continue to do so. The financial institution where your Roth lives won't help you in this regard. They don't know anything about your income, so they won't tell you, oh, hey, you can't contribute that. You're on your own. Now, we've helped more than one client undo direct contributions to Roth in the past year because they made too much money to be eligible. It's a pain. It's just better to not make the mistake in the first place. The easiest way to avoid this is to wait until the calendar year has ended and when you're doing your taxes because you'll know what your total income is. Then you'll know for sure whether you can make a direct Roth IRA contribution. If you have up until the tax return filing deadline, which is April 15th-ish, you know, depending on the year, to make that contribution for the previous year. Backdoor Roth IRAs are this weirdly popular and attractive personal finance maneuver. But let me reassure you, your savings rate is so much more important than executing technically finicky maneuvers like this. People screw up backdoor Roth IRA contributions all the time. And unfortunately, people include financial professionals too. So what's the biggest thing people screw up? Not understanding IRA pro rata and aggregation rules. There's plenty of articles that go in depth on this, but if you don't want to do the deep dive, here's what you should keep in mind. So number one, you should have no money in your traditional IRA before you make the $6,000 contribution. So after you make a $6,000 contribution, if you have any other pre-tax money in your traditional IRA, and then you convert $6,000 from the traditional IRA to the Roth IRA, you are going to pay taxes on some portion of the converted $6,000. If the traditional IRA started empty, then you'll pay no taxes on the converted $6,000. So for example, Let's say you have $18,000 of pre-tax money in your traditional IRA. You contribute $6,000 as part of the backdoor Roth. You now have $24,000 total. You then convert $6,000. The IRS then does this calculation. So if $24,000, $18,000 is pre-tax, meaning 75% of this account is pre-tax. This is meaning that 75% of that converted $6,000 is pre-tax. So the calculation on what you have to pay is 6,000 times 75% equals 4,500 bucks you need to pay on your taxes. If you mess this up, you're going to be surprised come tax time when you find that you owe taxes on some portion of the converted money. This means you pay taxes on the 6,000 you contributed to your traditional IRA, and then you pay taxes again on some part of the 6,000 you moved from the traditional to the Roth. This kind of defeats the purpose. Now, paying taxes intentionally to convert money into a traditional IRA to a Roth is a legitimate tax minimization tactic but it's a separate tactic from backdoor Roth IRA contributions, and the two shouldn't be unwittingly combined. You owe just as much in taxes for $1 in bonus income as you do for $1 in salary. Taxes on your salary are easy to understand. You get a salary from your job, fill out a W-4 with your personal tax withholding information. Your company then roughly withholds enough taxes from each paycheck. No big surprises come April 15th. But bonuses don't work the same way, and for reference, RSU income is treated the same as bonus income all considered supplemental income. Now, taxes for bonus income are withheld automatically by your employer at the same rate, the supplemental tax rate, forever, which is 22%. So that's great if your personal top and marginal tax rate is 22% or close to it. But lots of people have different marginal tax rates. Many folks in tech, for example, have a marginal tax bracket of 35% or even 37 So let's say your top and marginal tax bracket is 37%. You get bonus income, taxes are withheld at 22%. You still owe another 15% in taxes on that bonus income. If your bonus income is $100,000, for example, $22,000 will be withheld, but you owe $37,000. So you still owe an extra $15,000 on top of what your company withholds. 
The main point is that for supplemental income like bonuses, the tax withholding rate is not necessarily right for you. The danger here is that if you don't realize this, you could get socked with an unexpected tax bill come April 15th, so the remaining tax would be low on that bonus income. Now, modern personal finance is really complicated, and unfairly so. I'm not at all surprised that these misunderstandings exist, but it's a problem that they do. Make the investment in yourself that you deserve. Continue to learn more about personal finance and engage the financial professionals you need to do all this stuff right. Thanks for joining me.